This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere, or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. This This is A Different Perspective perspective with Kevin Kevin Randall. Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. We have returned once again. Welcome to the final broadcast of a different perspective for 2016. Next time will be in 2017, I hope. Uh, My guest today is Noah Torres, who has a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. He has written five books, which I assume is going to be updated here in a moment, uh, and a motion picture screenplay. Along with Ruben Uarte, he has written two UFO books, Mexico's Roswell, the Chihuahua UFO crash. I kind of laugh at Chihuahua because I remember Les Nessman from the old WKRP calling it uh, Chihuahua. So anyhow, it is the uh, Mexico Roswell, the Chihuahua UFO crash, and the other Roswell UFO crash on the Texas-Mexico border. He has appeared in television documentaries and on various radio programs. He is a regular speaker at the Roswell UFO Museum's annual festival held each July, as well as other UFO-related conferences and events around the country. He has hosted the Edinburgh, Texas Out of This World UFO Conference for the last several years. So welcome, Noe Torres, to A Different Perspective. Kevin, thank you so much for having me on your show today. I'm very, very excited to be on with you. Uh, As we've worked on our UFO books over the past 10 years, Ruben and I have drawn uh, a lot of inspiration and a lot of material from the UFO books that you have published uh, has helped us immensely. Although our books have been mostly focused on events that have happened along the uh, Texas-Mexico border and in Mexico itself, uh, there's been there's been a lot of material that uh, where you and uh, you and Ruben and I have covered the same areas. So it's uh, you know I, I'm very appreciative for all the work that you have done, and thank you for inviting me on today. Well, you're most welcome, and I appreciate the kind words. I said that you had done uh, written two UFO books. I assume that has now been updated. How many how many UFO books have you in fact written? Well. We have uh, authored or co-authored a total of 12 uh, UFO-related books so far. Some of those we've worked with other authors. Um, uh, Ruben and I recently collaborated with two uh, brilliant gentlemen from uh, Mexico City, UFO researchers there, on a book called UFOs Over Mexico. 
and basically it's a history of, of UFO, uh, major UFO cases in Mexico, in the country of Mexico, since the 1800s to the present. So uh, this is the type of work that we're doing because a lot of the cases that relate to the southwest, the deep southwest, and northern Mexico are not really well known in uh, ufology. And so Ruben and I... Um, you know, given our interest in the history of Latin America, the history of Mexico, and the American Southwest, uh, we have kind of taken it up upon ourselves to look at how the topic of UFOs uh, is treated in this area. And um, we find that it's refreshingly different in how people approach it uh, than in the rest of the U.S. So we have really enjoyed ourselves. So you've been down into Mexico talking to the witnesses there, uh, people in Mexico City and that sort of thing, not just um, kind of reading what they might have published, but you're down there actually physically talking to the people. Oh, absolutely. And Ruben, is, Ruben has traveled in Mexico a lot more than I have. He is the liaison for MUFON uh, for Mexico and has been for over 10 years. Uh, so we all keep in close contact, Ruben more so than, than me, uh, with the, with the uh, boots on the ground UFO researchers throughout the country of Mexico. They're constantly sending him data and information, and uh, he passes it along to, to me. Uh, in, our, in our writing uh, relationship, I'm more of the uh, writer and researcher, and Ruben is more of the UFO guy, uh, just to clarify. Uh, however, uh, over the past 10 years that we've had this partnership going, uh, you know, it's been amazing to me, and I've learned a lot more about the topic of UFOs than, than I, I knew uh, before I started working with Ruben. So it has been an exciting uh, 10 years. Well, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's take a break here because we're, we're coming up against uh, our, our break times, obviously. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what you've all done with that. Uh, your website is www.roswellbooks.com. So for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about the books they've done, you can take a look there. And I usually have something on my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com to fill in some of the, the holes or gaps in the knowledge. So we'll be right back after this. So please stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. And we are back with Noe Torres, who is a Texan, I might say, who is responsible large, largely for the Edinburgh, Texas, out-of-this-world UFO conference that's uh, held every year and have some fabulous guests down there. He is also um, a publisher at www.roswellbooks.com. So they've done a number of books that deal with UFOs uh, that you can pick up uh, through his website. And when we went away, I was uh, interested in some of the things that he had been saying. I, obviously, he had been um, in, into Mexico uh, with uh, Ruben Yarte, uh, learning more about the Mexico UFO sightings. And one of the books that they published was Ro uh, Mexico's Roswell, the Chihuahua UFO crash. So I was going to ask him a little bit about that. So uh, given all of that introduction there, Noe, can you tell us a little bit about the Chihuahua UFO crash? Well, this was the first case, Kevin, that um, I became interested in uh, that related to a UFO incident that supposedly occurred along the Texas-Mexico border. Um, now, what's interesting is I didn't know Reuben at the time uh, at all, and I was writing a book about South Texas UFO cases. Um, well, let me just back up. It was a chapter in a book. Uh, the book had to do with South Texas legends and folk tales, uh, which I was I had written a couple of books about the history of South Texas, being a native South Texan from the Rio Grande Valley area, uh, down near Brownsville, McAllen, uh, South Padre Allen area, uh, just to, to give a geographical point of reference there. So I live in a town called Edinburgh, not, not far from Brownsville. Um, and I had been, uh, for some years, I had been uh, having this concept of putting together a, a collection of stories, tales, legends from this area. And uh, one of the chapters in my book had to do with UFO cases. Um, so I was doing research uh, both in local libraries and, and on the Internet at that time. And I ran across an interesting story that supposedly a UFO had collided with a small plane a uh, small airplane out of the El Paso International Airport on uh, in August 1974. Uh, the collision had occurred supposedly right across the Rio Grande River from a small Texas town uh, known as Presidio. And um, after the crash, the UFO had fallen down to the desert below. That's a Chihuahua desert. And... Um, Recovery teams from both the U.S. and Mexico went after the wreckage. Um, uh, interestingly, as the story develops, just to give you a very brief synopsis, and I'm sure some of your listeners have probably heard this, but the Mexicans arrived first. They were unprepared. They did not have the appropriate gear uh, or experience to deal with, with what they found at the scene. And it ended up that the entire team of Ruben and I estimate between 20 and 32 Mexican soldiers all died uh, from exposure to something at the crash site. We're not certain what. Uh, and shortly after that, the U.S. team arrived. Of course, they had the uh, biohazard gear. They had all the proper equipment. It was a team that had been hastily assembled at, at uh, an Army base uh, located in El Paso. 
and choppered into that location. Uh, well, let, where me, they let, me, recruit, let me interrupt yeah, you right here because I, ha okay. I have a question. You say uh, it, 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 uh, that they arrived in the proper biohazard gear and that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, was there some kind of communication between the Mexican government, the Mexican authorities, and uh, the U.S. military, which I think it's what, uh, Fort, Fort Bliss there in El Paso? Uh, was, there some kind, was there some kind of communication uh, between them so that the, the American uh, contingent would know what kind of gear they needed? Well, um, they had been uh, tracking this object on the U.S. side. Uh, it first appeared over the Gulf of Mexico, uh, east of Corpus Christi. Uh, and it had been, uh, it followed basically the curvature of, of the state of Texas remaining out in open waters until it got down south around Brownsville, Texas, which is right at the tip of, of the state of Texas. Um, Brownsville adjoins Matamoros, Mexico, which is the northeasternmost tip of the country of Mexico. And right there at the mouth of the Rio Grande River, that's where the Rio Grande River, which uh, begins up in the mountains of Colorado and empties into the Gulf of Mexico right there, uh, where Brownsville, Texas, and Matamoros, Mexico meet. So right there, just south of there, is where the uh, UFO is reported to have come inland into northern Mexico and then streaked across, going at a tremendous speed, reported somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 miles per hour, and eventually um, was reported to have crashed. Now, while this was while it was zigging and zagging and changing altitude several times and and going, um, you know, headed toward West Texas, uh, northern northern Mexico, West Texas area, uh, there was supposedly tracking being done by the U.S. and uh, the appropriate uh, uh, team re retrieval team, crash retrieval team, had been readied and um, was brought in. Uh, Fort Bliss was used as a staging area so that after the crash happened the next morning, uh, this, the crash happened at about 10 p.m. Texas time, central time, and the next morning is when uh, the team left Fort Bliss having assembled overnight uh, various uh, operators from various locations in the U.S. had been brought together there at Fort Bliss, the story goes, and uh, by helicopter convoy were brought down into Mexico, which, by the way, Ruben and I have walked the area where this crash supposedly happened, and uh, you can actually look. Uh, you can't see the Rio Grande River because it's on the other side of some uh, of a of a mountain range that fronts the river there. But it's uh, I would we would have to say within 15 miles uh, if you were able to drive. Uh, over that range and and down to the uh, edge of the river, so we're talking about a very very close to uh, to the U.S. where the crash location was. So the Mexican authorities got there first. Did they wait overnight or did they um, move immediately once things were down? They moved immediately. Um, so they would have gotten there in the dark. Let me back up a little bit. The Mexicans arrived, and I want to correct myself on that, and it was good of you to have uh, noticed that. The Mexicans arrived the next morning, and the U.S. didn't arrive until the afternoon uh, okay. of the next day. Uh, the Mexicans attempted to move it in the morning, uh, right after daylight. They, they sent a spotter plane first, located the wreckage, and then uh, troops out of the Army base in Ojinaga, Mexico, uh, Okinaga is a town that, that is on directly across the International Bridge from Presidio, Texas, and Ruben and I have been down there on multiple occasions. Um, so there was a convoy of vehicles, including a cargo uh, trailer, uh, truck trailer, that went out into the desert after the wreckage had been located, and supposedly, the story goes, that the Mexicans thought that they were just looking for a downed aircraft, uh, the small uh, plane that had taken off from El Paso the night before and crashed in the desert. Uh, but when they got to the uh, crash site, they found the wreckage of the plane, but then a short distance away, they found a nearly intact uh, silver disc um, 
lying in the desert. Um, so then they received instructions to go ahead and pick that uh, pick that up and and. We we have did they did Buffalo they get Island. did they get inside of it were there were there any evidences of alien creatures around it at all were they or did was it there was just a, there was no evidence uh, based on the uh, information we found uh, there was no evidence of any beings uh, at the crash location but we're not certain if there may have been beings inside the craft after it was recovered by the U.S. and brought back. Um, by the U.S. team and brought back into the U.S. It's so the, the Mexicans, the Mexican soldiers, or the Mexican team didn't uh, attempt to open it. Then they did not attempt to open it, uh, from what, from the information we have. But they did. Uh, w they were instructed to bring it back to base. Um, from that location, which Ruben and I have visited, and it's it's really rugged. There's nothing, literally nothing out there. It's just open desert. Um, and uh, we've walked that area, and from there, uh, it, it would be almost as close to go to the, the big Air Force base in Chihuahua, Mexico, Chihuahua City, as it would be to go back to the Army base in, uh, in Ojinaga along the Texas border. So in talking to our counterparts in Mexico, there's a feeling that the, the recovery team from Mexico may have actually headed back to uh, headed over to Chihuahua, um, this being considered an Air Force matter, uh, probably it's likely that they were instructed to deliver it to the Mexican Air Force at their base in Chihuahua. So they were able to load. They were able to load the craft on their equipment there yeah. and start the convoy back, well, or or to the uh, the Air Force base there in Chihuahua. We estimate that they uh, within perhaps an hour after they headed back toward their base, whichever of the two bases they were instructed to go to, uh, within an hour uh, is when uh, the soldiers started feel feeling ill and um, started succumbing to whatever it was that eventually killed all of them. When the U.S. reconnaissance planes and satellites overlooked the area uh, moments later, uh, then they saw uh, bodies um, fallen uh, from the jeeps, uh, some of them partially in the jeep still, and hanging out somewhere in the desert, lying in the sand. Uh, it had, uh, the indications were that something acted fairly rapidly at about the same time on all the men. Were there uh, any civilians in the area? Or was this, this uh, open no, area? No, having, having been in that area, there's, I mean, you can, you can, you can drive, you, using an all-terrain vehicle, you can drive an hour or two and not see any signs of life whatsoever. So there were no civilian casualties then? Not that we know of. Um, we think it was all soldiers. Okay, so we, we, we've, the convoy has now obviously stopped. Um, right. The U.S. is aware of this? And, and we get back to the original question was, was there communication between the Mexican authorities and the American authorities, or did the American authorities sort of usurp the, the Mexican um, government? Well, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of debate about that. It, it, goes, all the, it goes all the way uh, along the spectrum from uh, the U.S. had secret agreements in the case of, because we had a lot of our uh, rocket technology and so forth that crash landed in northern Mexico, that those are documented cases, so that we had some kind of agreement to go in and recover our stuff if it fell in Mexico, and that had been exercised over the years. Ruben and I found many instances of that where the U.S. was allowed to go in and recover their stuff, their hardware. Uh, which was coming out of Los Alamos and various other places, uh, test firing of rockets and uh, experimental aircraft and so forth that crashed in Mexico. So the so cover there, could have been that so, there was one of ours. So what you're, say, what you're saying is there was sort of a historical precedent for the right. U.S. Uh, authorities coming there in. There was definitely a his, uh, documented historical pre precedent for this okay. happening. Well, but we're going to have are people... There are people who feel that that wasn't it at all. We're going to have to take another quick break here, believe it or not. We're 
up against uh, the time limit. When we come back, we're going to get a little bit deeper into the story of the UFO crash in Chihuahua with Noah Torres, whose website is www.roswellbooks.com, and you can find his book, uh, Mexico's Roswell, the Chihuahua UFO crash there, and, and other, other books about the topic. We will be back in just a few moments. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone broadcast network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. And we have returned with Noah Torres about uh, UFOs, obviously. We were talking about Mexico's Roswell UFO crash at the... 
in Chihuahua. And when we left, we had the Mexican soldiers having succumbed to something, uh, I guess, associated with the UFO and the United States using a precedent that um, had been established. And I, I know of at least one case where the uh, uh, rocket off of White Sands missile range uh, fell in in Mexico. So, uh, you know, it's not not unprecedented. So using that precedent, I guess, they moved into um, the, the, at, onto the crash site and recovered the craft and, and maybe the Mexican soldiers. I don't know. Um, and we'll find out just momentarily here. So, no, he did. Did they recover the craft and did they re pick up the bodies of the Mexican uh, soldiers? The U.S. Uh, team, uh, which was reportedly a team of CIA uh, operatives, uh, came in fully prepared with, as I previously mentioned, the correct biohazard gear and the correct equipment. Uh, they had been, uh, the, the members of the team had obviously been on similar recovery efforts elsewhere. Um, we were told by uh, Elaine Douglas, who helped us tremendously with the book, that there is a team uh, that is always at the ready uh, for events like this. And um, she strongly believed that it was this team uh, that was uh, brought together, uh, assembled hastily at Fort Bliss, and then uh, helicoptered down into Chihuahua, which is, is very close, by the way, to the Fort Bliss area. It's just a short uh, helicopter ride from there. And we have witnesses on both sides on the U.S. and Mexico side that saw those helicopters, by the way, August 1974. Uh, and that is not an area of Texas where there was a lot of helicopter traffic. Well, you've got, Fort, large you've got Fort Bliss there, and they've got, they've, uh, it's what I think it's the Biggs Army Airfield is right there at Fort Bliss, so they would have had yeah, helicopter but, uh, operations. Yeah, but we're, we're talking about 300 miles south of there uh, in the okay. area of Presidio. Uh, there's no air traffic to speak of. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so uh, getting back to your question, uh, so they went down there and uh, recovered the, the craft. Um, they um, redid the, uh, the har harness that the Mexican soldiers had put on it, and they uh, hooked it up to the uh, cargo helicopter that was hovering overhead, and they lifted it up, uh, we think covered, covered in a tarp. Um, um, and so it was lifted up off the flatbed trailer and um, the interesting and, and kind of bizarre twist to the story at that point is that supposedly the CIA uh, team gathered together all of the debris including the bodies of the Mexican soldiers and set off a high explosive charge um, to basically obliterate the remaining evidence at the scene before all of the uh, helicopters headed back across a very short distance there, 15, 20 miles uh, back into Texas. Uh, and interestingly enough, there's a lot of land in that area of West Texas that belongs to the federal government, uh, especially around McDonald Observatory, um, one of the most renowned astronomical observatories in the United States. So it was there... Uh, the story goes that the uh, helicopter convoy landed and spent the night because it was this was getting uh, close to nighttime, uh, 24 hours after the initial crash uh, of the UFO and the small plane, and so they spent the night on this federal preserve, this federal land uh, in the area of the uh, McDonald Observatory uh, before they headed on. Um, to uh, rendezvous with a um, convoy of trucks in the Midland, Texas area, but not quite to Midland. It's just uh, an, an intersection of two large highways there, state highways in Texas. And supposedly uh, they transferred the, uh, the UFO onto the truck convoy, and then the, the truck convoy took it the rest of the distance we believe um, to the Center for Disease Control, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, which in 1974 was, by the way, uh, the world's most advanced facility for um, 
determining the cause of biological uh, contamination or uh, any any type of disease, organisms or agents. Well, and this brings this, thinking, this this yeah. brings a couple of questions to mind, and and one of them is they don't know or did they know what had killed the Mexican soldiers? They did not know, um, and so I, I'm. I mean, we believe that the U.S. maintained um, the the team, the recovery team maintained their, um, you know, their practices of of uh, keeping themselves safe from exposure to this, to but whatever it was that killed the soldiers. They're the they're time. driving they're driving this thing across the United States. What sort of precautions did they take to make sure that that they didn't affect um, citizens on the way? There was a. Uh, <clears throat> There were um, procedures in place for how NASA would handle um, an, a spacecraft or object that came down to the Earth's atmosphere and might be contaminated. Uh, and we think some of these materials may have been used to cover the object um, and to protect it from leaking anything out into the, uh, the surrounding atmosphere. Um, all of this is speculation because we have nothing in the documentation, the information that we got that spells out exactly what techniques were used to transport it, other than it did it was transported in a convoy, convoy of uh, military vehicles, all the way from West Texas to um, to Atlanta, Georgia. We've traced the possible routes. Um, well, let's 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 go let's go talk about the documentation because you brought that up. Uh, you you say there's no documentation for the the transport from uh, the observatory to Atlanta, but do you have documentation on other aspects of this? Because you you said there was some do uh, implied there was some documentation. Well, we're we're based most of the story is based uh, on a document called the Deneb Report. That's D E N E B. Uh, Deneb is actually refers to a star. Yeah. In uh, in the sky, you know, at night, one of the most uh, observable from Earth, with the naked eye, and um, it, it's interesting if you trace back the whole history of Deneb and and its place in uh, literature and folklore over the years. But that's a whole other direction. But what it is is, according to Elaine Douglas, who did a lot of research into this uh, before she passed away, and we are very thankful to have her as an active contributor to our book. She wrote a chapter in the book, by the way. Elaine Douglas was a um, veteran UFO researcher who had, you know, had been involved in UFO research since, I think, the early 60s. And she had been involved in um, Project Cause and a number of other um, attempts to get the U.S. government to reveal more information that it has stored away about past UFO incidents, and Elaine uh, Douglas uh, felt that the Deneb report, which this story is based on, uh, was basically a group of government insiders who worked in the intelligence services and who frequently, uh, because of the nature of, of their work, they did not have any tangible um, documents or any they didn't have any evidence in hand that they could show anyone they were not allowed to leave the facilities in which they work with anything physical on their person or anything even you know digital form or anything so um, they would reassemble it just from their memories later and they would put together what they had seen what had crossed their desk they would um, this group would meet in secret and would share data about various UFO and other paranormal type events that that the military and the government was involved. Well, with, is this is this is this denim is this denim report? Is that a physical document or is it sort of an oral it is tradition? A physical document. Yeah, it's a and, physical document. It was sent to Elaine Douglas. Um, and a number of other major UFO researchers in the um, in the mid-70s, um, Leonard Stringfield received a copy. He and Elaine worked on it, and it appears in one of uh, Leonard Stringfield's uh, reports. 
His status right? reports. I think they were yes, called status, status reports. reports. 77, 78 time frame. He was very interested in this case, and uh, it certainly registered on his on his radar screen. And um, so Ruben and I were extremely intrigued. For me, it started because it happened so close to where I live. And um, but as, as it went on, and we started talking to people in Mexico, we found witnesses on both sides of the border that said something really unusual was going on in that area in August 1974. We talked to a young man who, um, or, or a gentleman who was a young man at Fort Bliss in August 1974 and saw a lot of really strange activity going on at the base. And just, um, I guess you could say, Kevin, that it's a lot of little circumstantial bits and pieces that all seem to point to an element of truth in the Denim report, and, you know, even though as a whole, probably people from the outside looking in would say, you don't have really a lot of tangible evidence there, but it, it, it's an intriguing well, story. Well, let's, let's chase, let's chase the documentation a little bit further, because if a small plane took off from El Paso and crashed in Mexico, did you search for documentation about that aircraft accident? Well, here's the deal. 1974, and we talked to our counterparts in uh, the civilian UFO researchers in Mexico have been very, very helpful with this. Um, but what the deal is that in 1974, there was a lot of um, airplane traffic in the El Paso area. Some of it was legal, were legal flights, and some of them were flying under the radar. Screen, let's put it that way, with shipments of illegal drugs. And um, so all attempts have failed to try to find any documentation about who might have been flying that plane. Um, you know, we, we don't have a good fix on that. We did, interestingly enough, we went down with the History Channel, Ruben and I, and uh, there's been two or three documentaries done on this. Actually, one, uh, there's been two, and then uh, the third one was put together from pieces of the first two about this incident. And we went down there with the History Channel to the crash site, to the area of the crash site, and we found the crash of a small plane in the desert right about where the Dennett document would indicate that it might have taken place. Uh, in fact, some of the, uh, in a nearby village, a small town called Koyame, I think the current population is like 500. So we had some people that t uh, told us that they're, they remember something about a crash in the 70s out. And so one of them took us out there, and sure enough, there were pieces of the small plane out in the desert. Well, we're going to have to we're going to have to take another quick break here, uh, given the timing of everything. Uh, when we come back, we'll follow up a little bit more on this uh, this case and see if there's uh, anything that happened after the. Uh, convoy arrived in Atlanta that we might be able to speculate about. As I say, if you want to learn more about this, take a look at uh, www.roswellbooks.com and we'll have more about this as well on uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. So we will come back after the break, blow. so please stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. 
It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And we are back with Noah Torres, who is the. Um Force behind RoswellBooks.com. Take a look at that. And we were talking about the Chihuahua UFO crash. And we noticed uh, that that, uh, Noe had said that the uh, recovery team had detonated the area or uh, caused an explosion. And I guess that was the truck convoy that was going away that they kind of blew all that stuff up. And he said they'd found an airplane, but that would have been located some miles away. So they didn't bother with that kind of wreckage. Uh, I think Noe can probably clarify that much better than I did if I haven't clarified it enough. Well, I think, Kevin, the the basic thing that happened is, except for the crashed UFO, which which the um, CIA operatives took with them, Everything else, including the wreckage from the plane and the bodies of the Mexican soldiers and the vehicles that the Mexicans drove out there, was all brought together. The vehicles were circled around, tightly compacted, and all of that was blown up with high explosives, according to the story, obliterating all evidence of what had happened out there. But Uh, you found aircraft wreckage. Yeah, I mean, we found... Pieces of an aircraft, we don't know if it's the aircraft. 
And, but I should mention that all of them were very small pieces, uh, and they were melted and fused, uh, like in some cases with uh, clumps of rocks and stuff. There was aluminum. The aluminum from the hull of the plane had literally uh, been turned into liquid and then had reformed. Um, you know, there were rivers of aluminum, uh, aluminum um, along the desert floor there and just small pieces. It was quite intriguing find, um, yeah, at that time. But when, we have no way of knowing if this was the actual plane or this might have been an unrelated plane craft. It, it was just interesting that it it happened in the area where the Deneb report would have suggested that this would have taken place. Okay, so we've got the we've got the uh, evidence obliterated 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 in Mexico, and we have the convoy going to Atlanta. So, right. do we know what happened once it got to Atlanta? The only thing I can say is it disappeared into that vast nothingness where nothingness where all UFO evidence seems to disappear somewhere in the innards of top secret government facilities somewhere we have no idea there's no mention of where it went after that um, but you know one interesting thing Kevin and it, this story believe it or not continues to this very day because just recently we've been examining evidence that somebody posted on Wikipedia of all places I had written a very basic summary of the Koyama incident uh, for Wikipedia and it was on there for years and then suddenly one day I was just messing around and I checked on the article on the Koyama crash and somebody had filled in the names of several Mexican soldiers uh, where I had just put that some Mexican soldiers were killed. They went in in parentheses and they named specific names with serial numbers from the Mexican army into the Wikipedia article. And Ruben and I were amazed. And we were trying to find out. Uh, we went in through Wikipedia. They wouldn't tell us anything about who the contributor was for that information. We tried to find them ourselves. We couldn't. And But what's really interesting is that uh, Ruben's contacts in Mexico uh, have confirmed two of the names uh, that appeared on Wikipedia as having um, being in military service in August 1974 in the Chihuahua area, and they both were killed, although the cause of death was not given as due to their involvement in a UFO recovery, obviously, were killed in the same time frame. So that's something that we're still pursuing. Uh, the Mexican researchers are still looking up uh, the other names that were given. Uh, Ruben and I have basically given up trying to find the guy who posted that information. We thought we had him for a while, and then he slipped away from us. He would never contact us. He refused to give us his real name. We offered to send him a copy of our book. He wouldn't take the bait, and so uh, he, he slipped out of view and is gone. Somebody that had some information somehow refused to tell us how he got it, um, but that's the very latest that we have on this. But but you don't know for certain that these soldiers were involved in the recovery operation, the attempted recovery well, operation. It's just extremely curious that they were in the uh, Mexican Army in August 1974, and they both died at that time in the August 1974 time frame. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a bunch of little circumstantial bits and pieces that uh, may or may not amount to anything in when it all said and done. Well, let's talk a minute about the Demet report because we're about to run out of time here. Uh, in you say uh, Elaine Douglas had received this from a, a source that she knew. Has anybody been able to FOIA anything that would lead us back to that or suggest that this is a document that was uh, authentic? If, can we can we find a government source for it? We cannot find an official government source. And Elaine's take on that was this is not information that the people who created would have want traced back to them. Uh, she believes that they all worked in government and in the intelligence services, and they were just doing this on their own after hours, uh, holding meetings and exchanging information among themselves. They never meant for it to go public. 
Um, she did a, spend a lot of time looking at the document. She has, she told us she had seen other similar documents uh, from similar. She called them um, informal think tanks. Is what she called them. And there was a tendency for these informal think tanks to take on subjects such as UFOs and other unexplained or paranormal type events that the government had evidence on. Did she know who the source was? No, this came anonymously in the mail to um, not just Elaine, but many, many other UFO, major UFO researchers of that time period, the mid to late 70s, Leonard Stringfield, I mentioned, a uh, number of others. Some people in the UK, some researchers in the UK received it as well. And the source for it was never, never ascertained uh, or who leaked it. Now, what's interesting is that we've been able to do research on this. Ruben and I found that it was all, it simultaneously also started appearing on electronic bulletin board services. Uh, the BBSs were a precursor to the modern internet. It was a place where people could get together and chat and exchange information online and could do do it anonymously if they so wish. So it suddenly started appearing on BBSs throughout the world, this very same document. You can still find uh, what the original posts on those BBSs look like. Uh, was there anything in the document that uh, led you to uh, the, the the crash you're talking about? Was there something specific that led to that, that crash that uh, could be confirmed at all? Any information that we could verify? You know, other than, other than the people we've spoken to in northern Mexico and in West Texas that saw odd things happening, saw an explosion, um, you know, heard about strange things happening in that very area where, frankly, this is desert country and not much happens there, um, you know, at least in that time period. So, yeah, other than that and the other things I've mentioned, it's really not, we're still, we're still trying to find out more. Uh, if we can find out more about the uh, Mexican soldiers whose name suddenly appeared on Wikipedia, that might be a direction we could go with that. Well, that sounds like a clue that would be valuable to follow up to see if we could learn anything. And I say we, meaning you and Ruben and your, your uh, friends in, in Mexico, the investigators in Mexico, uh, if they could find out anything more about how they died, that would be, that might be a, a break in the case that could lead us somewhere. We have some names of U.S. soldiers and their service record numbers also that we're, we're going to also pursue. I, there were about three that were posted mysteriously on Wikipedia as well, and we haven't even um, tackled the U.S. soldiers' um, background. Yes, we, we've been busy with the Mexican side of it. Was there... Um... I think you said it was staged out of Fort Bliss. Wasn't there? Wouldn't there be a, a base closer than Fort Bliss to this location on on the U.S. side? Not really. There's a there was an Air Force base in um, Del Rio, Texas, but it was a small base, mainly used for training. Um, so really, the big one of the largest uh, military bases in the world is uh, is there at Fort Bliss. In fact. It uh, part of it is in the state of New Mexico. Part of it is in Texas. It's such a huge military compound. Uh, yeah, so that that would be the the big gorilla there. Uh, that would be the place. There's so many places on that base where you could carry out clandestine uh, operations, and nobody would ever know. And and various runways uh, located throughout. Well, I think we've kind of run the gambit here and got as much information we, as we can drag out of you on the on this case, uh, including the Denim Report um, and your book, of course, uh, Mexico's Roswell, which is the Chihuahua UFO crash, which I assume is available at uh, www.roswellbooks.com. I want to we thank have you. We an update for... to the book, by the way, called the Koyama Incident, so it it brings together the latest information. Okay. So... Uh, Mexico's okay. Roswell was like uh, the first version, and then the latest one is the Koyama incident. It talks about the latest developments, such as the Wikipedia information and so forth. So 
either one of those um, both books cover the same ground okay well we're kind of running out of time here so I want to thank you for coming on the program and we will return next week with another uh, episode of, of a different perspective and take a look at uh, www.kevinrandall.com I'm sorry at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com which will talk about this and we will see you again in about 167 hours <laughs>